Today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping. It's our weekly What the Ship, where we look at the top five news stories going on around the world. I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So, as you can see, a lot going on. That was an attack against a bulk carrier out in the Red Sea, perpetrated by the Houthi. We have a lot of stories to cover. We're going to look at five stories from around the world, weave them together, try to explain what this means to you, the consumer, the shipper, the carrier out there regarding the global shipping. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. So you'll be alerted about new stories as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's stories. All right, I'm going to jump into our first story in a second, but this is kind of breaking news as of today, January 22nd. The Houthi are reporting an attack against a U.S. flag vessel. This is the motor vessel Ocean Jazz. Uh, it was sailing southbound through the Suez, coming through the area. This is the report right here from G Captain. This is it over on marine traffic. Uh, the vessel last pinged on AIS on 18 January. It has been holding in the Northern Red Sea since then, sailed through obviously today, and now the Houthi are reporting an attack. I will note that the U.S. is saying that the ship was not attacked and was able to get through. There were several other ships that came through. We know USNS Kanawa, a uh, military sealift command oiler, came out of Jeddah. It is now down in Djibouti right now. So it had come through the area. However, we're going to come back and talk about this because there are a lot of issues associated with U.S. flagged ships in this area. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number one. So story number one, update obviously on the Red Sea. The Houthi have continued their level of attacks against shipping. And what we're seeing here is several stories published by Lloyd's List. Uh, first one here, uh, Red Sea shipping is now divided down lines of risk appetite and national security. What we're seeing here is a reduction of nearly 40% of the number of ships going through the Bab El Mandeb. And since we say Bab El Mandeb, remember, you must drink. Always the rule here at what's going on with shipping. It's continued despite U.S. and U.K. airstrikes. So the big issue here is the U.S. U.K. launched a series of airstrikes starting on 10 January with the perception that this was going to reduce the level of Houthi attacks. And it has. The number of attacks have been reduced. However, they're still attacking. And what that has not done is alleviate the burden of the cost to go through this area. This is a great chart included in the Lloyd's List story showing vessels of over 10,000 tons that are traversing the area. So this is the very southern end of the Red Sea, and you'll notice here in terms of bulk carriers, the vessels carrying grain and ore, not much change. Pretty standard and pretty steady, not surprising. Product tankers, these are tankers that carry refined fuel, gasoline, diesel. We've seen a reduction in the number of those going through, a little bit more higher value vessels going through. Crude oil tankers, basically dump trucks carrying oil. This has not changed demonstrably. We really haven't seen the big change. Where you see it is in container ships. Nearly a one third, uh, excuse me, two third reduction in this area. And those container ships that are going through right now are smaller ones, regional container ships, ships of GFS and a few other lines going through. These are not the big Europe to Asia container ships going through, except for every now and then an odd one going through for Costco or CMA, CGM. But the vast majority of those are gone for a very good reason. It's the insurance costs. Give you an example. When MOL Comfort was lost back in the 2010s, that was an 8,000 box vessel. When that ship broke up and sank, the insurance paid out about a quarter of a billion dollars. Well, now you're talking about ships not of 8,000 containers, but of 20,000 containers. So the payout of that would be tremendously more, hence the reason you don't see them. LNGs, big reduction we're seeing in liquefied natural gas carriers. Really would not want to be on a ship that has a tank penetrated by a bomb and start expelling liquefied natural gas. Would not be good. See the same thing here for liquid petroleum gas. Further story by Lloyd's List, Suez Canal vessels transit plunge 34% in seven weeks. If you look at those numbers, you are seeing roughly about 440 ships weekly going through. That's down to 290 vessels. This is a massive plunge. It's not just the number of vessels, but the size of the vessels. If you look at tonnage, it's over half. And again, the Suez Canal generates about $10 billion 
for Egypt annually, about a half a million dollars per transit going through. And if Egypt is poised to lose half of that revenue, five billion dollars, Egypt's entire economy budget, I mean, their national budget is a hundred billion dollars. So this is a 5% reduction. This is terrible for Egypt, has huge ramifications about its ability to be a stable nation going forward. Now, a lot of you will ask, why doesn't Egypt do anything about this? Understand, Egypt's in a very tough position. If they go against the Houthi, that puts them on the side of Israel. Egypt shares a border with Gaza. What prevents Hamas from turning those missile launchers around from hitting, e from hitting Israel and aim them at Egypt, particularly the Suez Canal? And if they start aiming at the Suez Canal, you can see transits through the Suez go to zero. That's the worst case scenario. Dave Osler over at Lloyd's, another great story. Red Sea war risk rates see huge jump in wake of Yemen airstrikes. So again, the issue with the airstrikes, and let me be clear, the military did a great job, fantastic. I have no doubt in the US, UK's ability to hit and target and destroy things. They're, they're really good at it. The question is, is that the right strategy to convince the Houthi to stop firing? Because it's not just the Houthi you have to convince, it's the insurance companies. And the problem is once you accelerated and ramped this up a level, now the insurance companies have made it more expensive to go through. As Dave notes in this article here, the cost of war risk insurance for vessels transiting the Red Sea has tripled in the past week, with some quotes now hitting 1% of hull value. Such pricing would represent an additional $1.3 million on the cost of a brand new VLCC, this very large crude carrier, booked to load a consignment of crude from Saudi West Coast ports. So as you make these uh, voyages more expensive, you're precluding more and more ships from coming through. Next, we hit the story from Toma Renan. U.S. redesignates Houthi as a terrorist organization. First time this has been done since uh, designated by Donald Trump toward the end of his term. Uh, Joe Biden had reversed this. He had removed them in 2021. But now we see them put back on. They're not quite at the top level, but it's kind of the B level of terrorists. Plus, they got 30 days in which before this goes into effect. So I'm not exactly sure this is as powerful a weapon as they think it is. And then last story right here, something that we all friggin knew, but I guess we need to put it out there for everybody. Iranian and Hezbollah commanders helped direct Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. This is from Reuters. Uh, very clear that we all knew that Iran and Hezbollah were helping. Uh, we saw that with the shifting of the Iranian base ship out of the Red Sea into the Gulf of Aden and then ships being hit all over the Gulf of Aden. Story number two looks at the Red Sea, but looks at the impact of the Red Sea. Let's take a look at some impacts we're seeing directly. So one story out of uh, Lloyd's List, Chinese tonnage rises in Red Sea despite Houthi attacks. So even though we've seen some attacks against Chinese vessels in the past, we are seeing more and more Chinese ships show up in the area. And particularly what we're seeing is on their AIS automated information system uh, or identification system that we see is more and more calls for Chinese owned or Chinese crewed vessel. Matter of fact, so much so that a total of 17 out of the 27 Chinese container ships still active in the Red Sea transits are involved in calling at Russian ports. So we're definitely seeing that the use of China is being proliferated in this area, which really raises the question, who's doing a better job getting ships through this region? Is it the US and the UK using their warships or is it China just identifying with Chinese uh, companies and Chinese crews? Next, Cape Diversion sees shipping emissions soar. This is from Sam Chambers over at Splash. One of the things that's not being looked at enough is that new emissions factors went into play at the beginning of the year so that if you show up in Europe, you're going to pay a carbon tax. Well, if you're sailing around Africa and you're going pretty fast to make up your time, you're going to be dumping a lot of carbon. And what we're seeing is a negative impact on the environment, even though everybody's preaching and crying for better emissions and better protection of the environment, this is actually making the situation worse. Losing Nemo, CMA CGM reroute service to avoid Red Sea. So one of the players that's been going through the Red Sea has been CMA CGM. Now they haven't pulled all their ships off the route. This is the French carrier taking ships off the Australia service. Uh, which means they're going to make the longer route around. They, we still haven't seen them take completely off. Uh, the French have just dispatched another frigate to the area. We've seen the French Navy doing direct escorts of vessels through the area, and in particular ships of CMA CGM lines.
A uh, couple of stories here. Europe, Africa, crude market tightens on Red Sea disruptions, China demand. The oil market is making plans for Red Sea chaos to last for weeks. And then this story from Michelle Weiss Bachman over at Lloyd's. Houthi attacks to cut Suez oil trade flows by two thirds, says the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency. So by the end of January, only a third of the 7.2 million barrels per day of oil on tankers that transit the Red Sea and Suez will make the voyage based on the current trend. If oil can't go through this region, it's got to take the longer route around Africa. This is where we got VLCC and more importantly, ULCC, ultra large crude carriers, two, three million barrel oil tankers. Now, we don't have that many of them left anymore because there hasn't been a need to transport that large quantity of crude oil. Oil consumption is down. And you can go through the Suez, and the Suez has expanded its canal so that you can bring larger and larger ships through. But now with the potential closure of this route because of Houthi attacks, we may need to see a return to that. The problem is we don't have enough tankers. You're also seeing car carriers kick in. This is K-Line and NYK finally divert vehicle carriers via the Cape of Good Hope. Now, NYK is really shocking because it was their vessel the Galaxy Leader that was seized back in November 19th and the crew is still being held. But now we're seeing car carriers get in on the diversion. We're also seeing the impact this is having on Chinese exporters with the Red Sea crisis. A couple of stories here that look at specific cases of exporters having a problem getting their goods out. And then finally, this story, and, and I'm always leery to talk about livestock carriers because it's an, it's an abysmal trade. But Australia recalled a livestock carrier and it departed uh, Fremantle uh, in early January uh, for Aqaba. But the ship is not going to be able to get into Aqaba. The plan was to actually sail the ship around Africa, come in through the northern end of the Suez into Aqaba in Jordan. But now the government in Australia has recalled the vessel. Uh, this is probably good because there's no telling how many, uh, how much of that livestock would have died in such a long transit over a vast area it, it's really just a, it's a really nasty trade you're not seeing as many livestock carriers out good because when they get into problems and accidents it is it is all right let's go ahead and jump to story number three all right story number three looks at the impact that the red sea is having directly on ships and merchant mariners so we looked at the red sea we looked at the impact it has on global shipping now we're looking at it on the mariners that are there so the video I had for you at the very beginning is this. This is a depiction of a, uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is, a lot of debate on whether it's a ballistic missile, a cruise missile, but it is a weapon that hits the motor vessels, uh, Graphia. Uh, you saw the image here. You can see the, uh, the, the, the explosion here recorded by the ship's camera up there in the forward hold. Now, a couple of things to note. Uh, this is a bulk carrier. Not exactly sure what it's carrying. It was sailing from Vietnam, so it may have been loaded with rice. So if, if you get a missile that comes in from above and plunges down in a deck and goes into a cargo of rice, uh, it's like hitting concrete. I, I mean, it's going to be really hard to do any sort of penetration. If you look at the type of anti-ship crews and ballistic missiles the, the Houthi have, these are not Chinese. These, these are Iranian design. Smaller warheads. These are not 2,000-pound bombs. These are like 200 pounds, 300 pounds. So limited uh, explosive force. Plus, these are big honking ships. Most weapons are designed to blow up warships, which tend to be tiny compared to a commercial vessel. And so this is why you see these strikes not seeming to do a lot of damage. And then you get this story that kind of builds on this. This is a story, Houthi missiles do far more damage to trade than ships. This is the motor vessel Jenko Picardi. And as you notice here in the circle, this is where a weapon hit. We're not sure if this is a drone that hit or a missile, but you can see the damage. And I had a lot of people comment about this and sit there and say, well, that looks like, you know, a, merely a flesh wound. Well, okay, it depends where it hits. If it hits the cargo hold, depending on what the cargo is, that could be really bad. If this hit up on the bridge area, that would have wiped out part of the bridge crew. If it is able to penetrate through this area into the superstructure, the house could kill crew members in their staterooms. And if it penetrates further through the deck into the engine room, that could be catastrophic. So just because it doesn't appear to be lots of damage being caused by these weapons, it doesn't mean it's not dangerous. 
And I think we keep kind of lowering the, the, the issue here of how severe these attacks are. Uh, these are not warships. They're not designed to be hit. And so they have minimal crew on board. And fortunately, we haven't seen fires break out that run the, the length of the ship. And we haven't seen anybody injured or killed yet. But again, that's so far. It's only a matter of time till that happens. This story over at Splash 24-7, we need a convoy system past Yemen now. Okay, I'm going to debate this a little bit because I don't think the solution is just a convoy system because let's be clear, not every ship is going to want to convoy. What you need is a convoy system for high value, high risk targets like the container ships, like ships of national registries or national ownerships that the Houthi have a problem with. They have mentioned they're targeting U.S., U.K., Israeli vessels. Then you need to set up a convoy system. The problem right now with the convoy system is there's not enough ships right there. The U.S. has four destroyers in the area. The British have a destroyer of frigates in the area. French have a frigate, the Italians have a frigate. There are not enough assets in the area to cover the entire coast of Yemen from the Saudi border in the Red Sea to the Oman border in the Gulf of Aden. You need more ships. And if you're going to escort, that pulls ships away and you need to have capable vessels to do this. Just because a Navy donates a ship doesn't mean it can defeat an incoming drone, cruise, or more importantly, ballistic missile. And the Houthi have demonstrated their ability to reach out and touch people with weapons that a lot of people said could not hit ships, such as ballistic missiles. So while I think there is a case for convoys, this needs to be looked at in a 2024 version. You can't just, you know, uh, Tom Hanks this in Greyhound and run a 37 ship convoy pass with four destroyers. You need some, or three destroyers in a court. Uh, you need, uh, you need something else. And again, this is a tough problem because the commander out there, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, commander of Fifth Fleet and the Combined Maritime Force, has limited resources. Plus, he needs to guard an aircraft carrier. He needs to guard some high-value auxiliary vessels in and out of the area. And he has to rotate ships in and out for fuel and ammunition as they expend ordnance. And the problem is you got to send ships all the way back to Bahrain or Diego Garcia to go replenish your ordnance. This is a big problem. And he does not have a wealth of resources to do this. Second, this letter was sent to General Van Ovis, the head of U.S. Transportation Command, by nine unions. Nine maritime unions agreed on something. You don't know how unheard of that is. Nine maritime unions wouldn't agree that we're in 2024 right now. But they all managed to get together on the topic of enhanced communication in the Red Sea. So I'm going to get on a hobby horse here for a minute. I'm going to get on a soapbox for a second and talk about this because I got some flack from some shipping companies about this because I've been talking about this, the fact that there is not secure communication on board ships sailing through the region, in particularly U.S. flag vessels. And I know this because I've talked to crews on board. So when people ask me how I know, Sal, you're in beautiful North Carolina at Campbell University. How do you know what's going on in the Red Sea? People talk. And they talk because they're frustrated and they talk to me because they're not getting action from either the military, their operating companies, or anybody else. You need secure communication. You need to be able to pick up a secure phone and talk to somebody without with knowing that no one else is listening to you, especially if you have to report issues and problems or you want the Navy to direct you to go one way or another. Do any good to get on open communications and scream that out. It also doesn't do any good to call on a, on a satellite phone if you're calling the wrong phone. So this should not be a problem. The U.S. Navy has an entire organization, NCACS, that is geared for this. Military Seal of Command has secure communications. There's not that many U.S. flag vessels going through this region that you cannot slap on this. I mean, there are armed security teams that hop on board ships at the beginning and end of the Red Sea to ride them through. Why we can't do that for our own ships, I don't know. This is a problem for me because if we can't do this fighting the friggin' Houthi, how are we going to do it if we got to fight the Iranians, the Russians, or heaven forbid, the Chinese? All right, I'll get off my soapbox now. My apologies. U.S. U.K. seafarers to earn double pay for Red Sea transits. All right, getting back up on the soapbox again. Yep, I'm going to do it one more time. So this story would make you believe that U.S. and U.K. seafarers are earning double pay for Red Sea transits. I know for a fact the U.S. is not. I know. 
Now, I know this SIU, the uh, unlicensed union, has been able to work this out and get more money for their personnel. However, the officer unions, AMO, MEBA, MMP, have not been able to work it out for the companies. And understand, it's not the union's fault. It is the ship operating company's fault and the people they have contracts with. If you are going to send ships through like the Ocean Jazz or like a Maersk ship or a Waterman ship or a ship of Liberty or any other company through, you should pay the crews the money you owe them. You are putting them at risk. Everybody else is sending their ship around the long way. If you are going to send your ship through these shortcut basically right now and take the chance of getting a missile or drone shot at you, then you pay the crew. Understand you're not paying the crew a huge amount of money. This is not going to bankrupt the company. You're talking about wages for several days seem steaming through a war zone. But the fact that they're not willing to do this goes back to a long tradition of this. During the Vietnam War, mariners were not allowed to get paid. It had to be worked out so that when they got shot at, and let me be clear, I did the history of this, they got shot at on a fairly routine basis, sailing from Vung Tau to, to Saigon through uh, the Rungsat. They were not getting paid until they basically had to push it through. Same thing with merchant mariners in World War II. So here, if you want to put merchant mariners at risk, you need to pay them. Ironically, foreign merchant mariners are probably getting paid double or what they deserve for this through their agreements. Now, the problem is what they're getting paid is ridiculously low to begin with. And so twice of nothing isn't really that much. But again, this is merchant mariners sailing ships through. And understand, some of these ships are hauling aid food. Some of them are hauling gear for the Department of Defense. I'm not exactly sure what the hesitation is here to pay these crews the money that they deserve. Okay, sorry. I, I don't mean to get worked up. I just have a lot of compassion for those out on ships. And when I see them being treated like, what's the word? Crap. Uh, I tend to get a little emotional about it. Sorry, won't happen again. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number four. We're going to take us away from the Red Sea and look at some other issues happening around the world and some really interesting developments going on. So story number four takes us down to Australia. Always love talking about Australia. I don't ever get a chance to talk about it enough. Australia's minister condemns DP World in port dispute. So DP World, this is based out of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, they run ports in and around Australia. So right here, sailing costs and fear, uh, spiraling costs and fears for companies hit the dispute between DP World and the Docker employees. Uh, saw Australia's Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Tony Burke, launch an extraordinary attack on the Middle Eastern company. Now, this goes back to a long-standing dispute between the Maritime Union of Australia, which is a amazing union, very powerful union down there, uh, and DP World. Now. This is a big part of their economy. Uh, this, this involves 1.34 billion Australian dollars. And this dispute is costing up to $23 million a day. So what Tony Burke said at a press conference is this, quote, I've made clear to both groups today that I have no intention of intervening. I've made clear that I have an expectation that they will reach an agreement. I will say, I think Australians are sick to death of having highly profitable companies say everything is the fault of them having to pay their workforce the same as their competitors. So the issue here is, again, the Australian Union wants to see pay raises for their employees. DP World does not want to pay that. And here you have the minister coming out and saying he's not going to choose sides. However, if you keep picking on the workers and say you can't afford to pay them, that's a problem. Goes on here. I met today with both DP World and the Maritime Union. I've made it very clear that I expect the parties to be at the table, to be negotiating and to resolve this uh, again this is a big issue because if strike breaks down in australia and you're not able to move goods australia is extremely dependent on maritime unions to move goods on and off ships completely dependent on shipping bringing goods in and out australia has basically denuded itself of its own merchant marine uh, it's completely almost entirely reliant on foreign ships for its trade uh, it witnessed issues with trade back during the supply chain crisis. This has the potential to be a major issue for Australia. The story is also great because it has a comment from Sal. I, I, I have to read a story that has a comment from Sal. Sal said it found the minister's failure to acknowledge the impact of the industrial action 
on the Austra Australian economy surprising, given that it raised the issue with him by letter on two occasions. Wow, well, I should be clear. Sal is not me. Shipping Australia Limited. That is Sal. Goes on here. The first time Sal wrote to the ministers was on 16 November when we summarized some key economic modeling and provided a range of references to publicly available reports. Second time was on 9 January when we repeated much of the content of the previous letter and also sent a copy of the economic modeling. Sal goes on to say, I'm going to keep saying that because I enjoy saying that so much. Sal said, we have heard from businesses that the Australian supply chain is at or near breaking point. That truck operators are worried they will have to close businesses that fast moving goods suppliers might get delisted by retailers that exports cannot export, that ocean carriers are experiencing 10 days or delay or more, and that Australia's inter international reputation is being tarnished. Added Shipping Australia Limited. Sal. So Australia under a lot of pressure. Understand when you have issues on dockside, when you have issues with shipping companies, this resonates. Be warned, we're seeing issues starting to appear on the east coast of the United States where the International Longshore Association, the ILA, not the ILWU, but the ILA, which runs a lot of ports on the east coast, not entirely, but some ports and some certain areas of operation on the east coast has their agreement expiring in September of this year, that contract could be a big problem, especially with a presidential uh, election looming on the horizon. All right, let's go ahead to story number five. Uh, story number five. Story number five deals with a shakeup in ocean containers. The Alliance members left with few options in wake of Hophog Lloyd's departure. So one of the big announcements that took place last week was the decision by Hophog Lloyd, one of the big ocean carriers, to leave the Alliance next year and join with Maersk in what is being called the Gemini co uh, Cooperation. Uh, it, it's a weird name for a variety of reasons. Gemini, obviously for the twins, and Cooperation, because they want to get away from an Alliance, so they want to get rid of that name. So Hophog leaving the Alliance, the Alliance was already the smallest of the three big container uh, alliances. Out there, so what am I talking about, Sal, when I talk about container alliance? So this is it right here. So container shipping is controlled by roughly about 10 companies. 10 companies control about 85% of all the major ocean shipping containers worldwide. And they were organized into three kind of alliances. There was what was called the 2M alliance. That was MSC and Maersk. Now, MSC and Maersk are still in this alliance. However, it ends at the end of this year. Uh, and then there was the Ocean Alliance. The Ocean Alliance is a really interesting one. It was the second largest of the alliances. It includes CMA CGM, which is a French firm, but then it included Evergreen, which is of Taiwan, and Costco, which is mainland China. Yeah, T Taiwan and China are allied together in an economic alliance. Uh, in this case, it's an ocean shipping agreement. And then the alliance, which contained Hapag Lloyd, ONE, this is the conglomeration of the Japanese firm, Ocean Network uh, Express, Yangmin, and HMM. And if Hapag Lloyd leaves, which they will do now, uh, and join with Maersk, you'll see Gemini poses to jump to second place. Now, the reason MSC and Maersk split is they were too big. They were just too big. Maersk, I mean, MSC controlled almost 20%, Maersk about 15%, that is 35%. That is a huge, massive amount. And the ocean carriers are under a lot of attention about antitrust and basically cartel uh, alliances. Uh, right now, they operate under an exemption so that they're not under these, these kind of antitrust issues. However, the EU just recently repealed that. There's a lot of attention in the United States to repeal that. And so if MSC and Maersk and the 2M alliance got too big, if they hit 40%, that was going to trigger a lot of alarm. So they're separating out. Now, the history of these alliances was they were created to bring smaller companies together to battle the bigger companies. Well, what we've seen is three alliances emerge that monopolize 85%. So you had 2M, you had the Ocean Alliance, and you have the Well, now we're having the resorting. And now what we're seeing is Maersk and Hophog forming Gemini. What's going to be interesting here is what happens next. So the Ocean Alliance will stay firm. Probably. The question is the alliance. It's made up of three small companies. right? Now. Do they add another company to this? Does another company 
jump in does zim or wang high or one of the other smaller pill civica international lines jump in uh, the problem is whatever you add here is going to only be a few percentage points it's not a lot the question i have is does msc pull off one of these does it pull one yangmin or hmm up to plus up its size to make it comparable to gemini and the ocean alliance because if that happens the alliance will fall apart and then you may see one of these smaller lines collapse entirely uh that's what's happened with hanjin and back in 2017 when the seventh largest ocean carrier on the planet all of a sudden declared bankruptcy and its 94 ships were floating around lost when you look at capacity here it gives you an idea of capacity what these new alliances have Ocean Alliance is poised at roughly about 5.5 million TEUs. Gemini is sitting there at about 3.4 million, almost identical to Mediterranean shipping, whereas the Alliance is sitting there at roughly about 2.6 million TEUs. And again, if you look in terms of ships, definitely the Ocean Alliance is the largest in that way. Gemini comes in second, and then MSE. And where Gemini will service is literally all over. But interestingly enough, they're going to control about 39% of that Europe med trade to the Persian Gulf and India subcontinent. And then they'll have about a third of the trade between Europe and the Mediterranean and America and Europe and the med to the Far East. And again, this is part of the bigger shakeout we're seeing. So to summarize, to put this all together for you, the viewer, what are we seeing? Well, number one, Houthi attacks continue. Even though the U.S. and the British stage these massive attacks and they're shooting still as we speak, they have not been able to stop the attacks, nor have they stopped targeting of ships. We saw a whole series of bulk carriers, U.S.-owned foreign flag bulk carriers get hit. That's going to further drive ships away from the Bob El Mandab. The... Uh, Attacks are not being deferred, but the biggest one that has to be convinced is the insurance company. As long as the insurance is rising, that's an issue. Now, interestingly enough, we saw a diminuization of this over on the uh, Black Sea, where Black Sea insurance rates started to drop uh, down from almost 3% down to 1.25%. That's tremendous, considering the fact that the Black Sea Grain Initiative has stopped and what we're seeing is, is movement of ships to and from Ukraine without any agreement by Russia, but Russia is not targeting them. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the Ukrainians have been very effective in pushing the Russian sea fleet back. We also didn't get a chance to talk about it in this story, but we're still seeing issues in and around the Panama Canal, which means that you're not going to be able to push ships through the Panama Canal. One of the unique trades that's developing is ships loaded with containers sail from asia they avoid la and long beach still they go through the neo panamax lane of the panama canal they hit the u.s east and gulf coast and then instead of taking a voyage through the panama canal which would take away from one coming from asia to the united states they head back to asia going initially through the suez canal but now they're going around africa and that's making for a much longer route and that's great for the container liners because they have excess capacity. Uh, it also allows them to charge more. So again, I don't think the container companies are really crying right now about this. The fear here is in the energy sector, anchors. One of the things we're seeing is the rise of what's called ton miles. So Ed Finley Richardson over on Twitter, X put this up, which I think is really important. Uh, this is based on Clarkson, a uh, data analytical firm that looks at the best case ton mile demand. So ton mile, basically very easy definition, how far you have to travel one ton. Now, how, how many miles does that have to go? It's a measurement. And what the Suez Canal diversion is doing is forcing ships to take longer distances. So what you see here is container ships, the ton mile uh, demand is up 8.6%. Crude tankers, not so much because crude tankers are still going through not really being targeted, and plus they have pretty low insurance value. Product tankers seen that rise, 5.6%. LNG, 4.4%. LPG carriers up 36 and now car carriers up 6.4%.
all of that is translating to these longer distances. And with the Panama Canal out, out or two thirds of its normal level, we're seeing ships and tonnage have to travel much longer distances. And that becomes an issue if you are short of ships as we are in the tanker sector, both for crude oil and for product tankers. And in terms of emissions, we were talking about the emissions going to Europe. So this does not bode well. And I know a lot of people are sitting there going, Sal, I'm in America. This doesn't affect me. This, I haven't seen any difference yet. It's coming. It takes a while for this to resonate through the system. The problem with shipping is by the time you see it, it's too late. And you have to know about this coming already. Because what we're seeing already in, a, in Europe is the impact of that. You're seeing inflation, you're seeing cost rise. You're going to see it in the United States. You're also going to see some key shortages and, and late deliveries because what's happening here is a lot of containers that need to get back to Asia, empty containers that need to be repacked and shipped back out, aren't going to get there in time. Matter of fact, they're not going to make the Chinese New Year, which is in early February, which means that when Chinese New Year hits and everything shuts in Asia for a week, if you don't get your stuff shipped before then, you're going to be waiting a week or two to get it. And then there's going to be a mad rush. And the fear is that energy costs in the spike, especially if we start seeing temperatures drop and it gets really cold in Europe, America. This is going to be a problem. We're already restructuring where LNG and LPG is going. We're going to see that with product tank. So being aware of this situation is crucial to understand whether you're a consumer, a shipper, or a I hope you enjoyed today's and hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. I love comments. Please tell me what you think. If you think I need to go into something more detail, if you think I got too high up on my, on my uh, a horse, you tell me. That's fine. I can, I, can, I can get rid of this soapbox. Let me know. I always love constructive criticism. However, I do reserve the right that if you're an ass, to remove you from the comment. Because again, civil conversation. Subscribe and like, hit that bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. Also, be sure to support the page. How do you do that? Beyond having civil discourse, you can hit that super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon where you can become a monthly yearly subscriber. Until our next episode, this is Sal.